I recognize this for that. I'm nothing of my own. I've made mistakes so often I've slipped. Just come in place and go. But I'll prove someday just what I now say. I'm a special kind. When he was on that cross, I was born his mind. A look of love was on his face as the boy pierced his head. The blood ran down his scarlet robe and painted crimson red though his eyes were on the crowd that day I believe he looked ahead in time when he I was on his mind, and that, even though I kind of butchered that tonight, uh, that leads right into my message. Uh, if you have your Bibles tonight, and you'd open them to Ephesians chapter 1, the first book, uh, the first chapter of the book of Ephesians, Paul's letter to the Ephesian church. Beginning in verse number three, actually, what I'm doing is I'm bypassing his greeting to the various members of the church. I'm not going to read that. That just takes up a little extra time. And uh, Ephesians chapter one, beginning of verse three, we stand in honor of the reading of God's word. I read from the King James text. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. I'm going to stop just for a quick second. I want to point something out. You've got to listen to the language here that, that Paul is using. Notice he says that... God has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Before the earth was created, God already, already had you and I in mind. But then he says that we should be holy and without blame before him. That's important language. In other words, 
he's saying that we should be holy and without blame in God's eyes. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're holy and without blame in the world's eyes. It doesn't necessarily mean you're holy and without blame in the church's eyes, but it means that before God, in God's eyes, you're holy and without blame. You, you ever seen a couple in love and the woman's so ugly that it's a miracle she can walk a dog without the thing running away from her? You ever seen a couple in love and the fella's so big and fat and ugly and you think to yourself, boy, how did he ever get that beautiful bride he's got? Because before him... The bride is beautiful. And before her, that groom is beautiful. You understand what I'm saying? And that's what Paul is saying, that in God's love and in God's grace, that we would appear before God holy and blameless before Him. It's not about how the world sees you, but it's about how God looks at you and how God sees you. Before Him in love. Not just before Him, but before Him in love. You've heard me talk about the fact that that we're in a love affair with God. God's in a love affair with us, this church. Let's read on. Verse 5. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good in the beloved, I'm sorry, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the Beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made, made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will." that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted. After that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. I'm going to talk to us just for a little while tonight on the topic of bought and paid for. Bought and paid for. Master, we love you tonight. We thank you, God. We're so grateful for the opportunity we had last week to visit friends at the Riverside Church in Fort Worth. We had a great time in your presence. And God, we appreciate good friends. We appreciate folks that love you and folks that years and years and years later we can go to and they'll reach out to us with love and just embrace us with a warm embrace. And we appreciate their friendship and their fellowship. And, Lord, we pray tonight that you're moving in a mighty way in that church, God. You're doing great things as Sean is there preaching this evening. And, Master, tonight we need you to move in this place. We need the Word of God to go forth in this place. There are people tonight that are relying upon this Word that will hear this message on tape, that will hear it on the Internet. And, God, we need the anointing because outside of the anointing I'm a useless piece of clay. Master, today we pray, God, use us in a great way. Perform mighty works, God. Move in the hearts of men and help us, God, to be drawn even closer to you. For we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated tonight. There is nothing so exciting as being able to declare that something is bought and paid for. You know, it's one thing to go to the car lot and to sign the paperwork and to drive a car off the lot. And then you know every month you've got a $300 payment. It's one thing to have to do that. It's another thing when you're able to go and you're able to buy something outright. And when you drive it off the lot, you know that you own it, lock, stock, and barrel. It is bought and paid for. You don't have another payment to make. I remember 
some years back when someone sent me an offering to help me get a vehicle when I was living in Connecticut and pastoring in Connecticut. And this gentleman sent about $5,000 or so. And it was to help me get a car. Well, I wanted to help the church some, so I, I made it in my mind. I said, I'll use 3000 toward a car, and I'll use the rest to help the church. And uh, I went out shopping for a car, and when I finally fell across that 88 Mercury Sable that I just have loved so much with that leather interior and all that fancy, you know, uh, all, the, all the extras you'd ever want, including the moon roof and all those wonderful things, and the car just looked like it was showroom new when I bought it. It's absolutely gorgeous. And when I paid Davey for that car, the man that I bought it from, uh, it was bought and paid for. I never had to make a single payment on it because it was already fully paid for. I was able to pay the entire price right up front. And, you know, that is such a wonderful feeling when something is bought and paid for, isn't it? It's a wonderful thing when you no longer have to do anything in order to purchase something because you've done everything there is to do. Children, I want you to know tonight, Jesus Christ has bought and paid for you and I. We are paid for. According to the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 1, we have been purchased. We are a purchased possession. And we are merely waiting for the day of redemption. We're the car that's sitting in the lot that the man has already come in and he's done all his negotiating and he's paid the price. He's written the check. And it's just a matter now. Uh, it's uh, only a matter of his taking delivery. It's just a matter of his coming and taking that vehicle into his possession. I used to sell cars. And believe me, I know that a lot of times uh, we would sell a vehicle, and that car was sold. It was gone. It was as good as gone. But now they wouldn't pay me until the man took delivery. The vehicle was sold, but until the man took delivery, then th it, we would have to sit and wait. So, you know, if we knew that the cutoff date on our pay week was Saturday, then, bless God, we'd be doing everything in our power to get that car off the lot by Saturday. Amen. Well, I'm going to tell you, I know that the cutoff date for payday for God's church is the beginning of the world's tribulation when the Antichrist is going to rise to power and God is going to unleash uh, unheard of, unimaginable judgment on the world and things are going to be happening that look like they come out of science fiction movies. But I want you to know today, you don't have to worry because before that payday comes, the master will come, and he will redeem his purchased possession. He will come, and he will take his church out of here. He doesn't plan on leaving us here. God will not judge the righteous with the wicked. That's the word of God. That's what the word of the Lord said. You know, in ancient biblical times, women were viewed as property. They were the property of their husband. Many look back at this practice, and immediately they assume uh, concepts of servitude and sometimes even slavery. But you know, in fact, the price of the woman was determined by the love and the attraction that the man held for her. The greater his love, the more he would pay. Some might here say, well, what about those who were poor? Well, even for the poor, the fact is that this principle remained the same. The only difference being that the price paid by the poorer man was contrasted with how much he owned and how much, uh, of, of, how much of value he possessed. A man might offer a single goat to his would-be father-in-law, but if that is the only goat he owned, the sole source of dairy products for his home, then this would be considered a very high price indeed. Yes, the woman was a possession of sorts, but she would be the man's greatest and most important acquisition. Amen. So even though they were viewed as property, you know, Aunt Dorothy this week had to go shopping for a new fridge. <laughs> Her old one kicked out, so she had to go shop for a new refrigerator. And uh, there are certain things that you can buy, and you may only have to buy one, two, three in your entire lifetime. 
A refrigerator can last, you know, 20, 30 years if you really treat it good and, you know, you don't have any problems. And uh, when you go and you're shopping for things that are important to you, for important purchases, you're that much more careful. You know, when you're going to put out a lot of money, you're a lot more careful when you're going to put a lot out for something. Amen. You're going to be a lot more careful. And I want you to know, for a man in biblical times, as he would be looking for a wife, that was his greatest acquisition. That was his greatest possession. So therefore, he would shop very carefully. This is why, you know, when you read in Scripture about how important it was that a woman be chaste and how important it was that a woman be, uh, uh, that she carry herself well and how important it was that she be, not trying to sound dopey or anything, but she be clean and she smell good and she look pretty, you know, because she was, if she was going to get a good husband, she had to really sell herself. She really had to carry herself in the, in the most positive possible light because a man was looking for a wife that was going to be a precious jewel in his crown. You know, if you look at the story in Genesis 29 of Jacob and how Jacob saw Rachel, and the Bible tells us that in essence, uh, Jacob fell in love with Rachel just the moment he laid eyes on her. In Genesis 29, 9 through 11, and while he... Yet spake with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she kept them. And it came to pass, when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. And Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice and wept. Boy, boyfriend fell hard, didn't he? He fell fast. <laughs> This is his cousin, Rachel. He married his cousin. It was his uncle's daughter. But you see, we today are the purchase of God, and we have been purchased with a great and precious price. We are not just the Lord's love interest, but we are also his most precious, valued, and costly possession. Even as Jacob worked for seven years to obtain his love interest, Rachel, even so the Lord provided a first covenant or a first contract, which was the law whereby he secured Israel. But then, Laban having pulled the trickaroo on him, he found he had to work another seven years in order to get Rachel because he wound up with the older daughter first, remember? Well, that's all right because Jesus came along and said, just like Jacob, he said, hey, here's a new contract. I'll go for the rest now. Amen. Now I want the Gentile people. I wanted the whole world to start with. But in the first covenant, all I got out of the deal was Israel. So now I want the rest of them. I want everybody. I want everybody to have access. I want everybody to be included. What the law could not do, the Lord was able to bring about a better covenant and do. And he was able to secure our salvation. In Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 4, the Apostle Paul writes, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So you see, what the law couldn't do, Jesus Christ coming in human form was able to accomplish. So therefore, he not only purchased the first daughter, but he went back and did what was necessary to purchase the second daughter, which was the Gentile nations. So you see, when you read the story of Jacob, a lot of times I don't think people realize that there is a parallel there, that there's, there's a foretelling there of what God was doing. 
The word of the Lord tells us in 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in times past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Peter begins that by saying, you are a chosen generation. That means, literally, you are hand-picked. God hand-picked you. Amen. He didn't just, you know... Uh, grab a bunch of flowers out of the garden and, and whatever he had, he had. No, he looked at each and every one of them and he chose which ones he wanted and he passed on those he didn't want. Amen. We are that uh, important possession. We are that costly uh, purchase that God has made that he might have a bride unto himself. Thank God. We're bought and paid for. In John chapter 15, verses 18 through 21, the word of the Lord said, If the world hates you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of this world, but I have chosen you out of this world. That's what Jesus said. He said, I have chosen you out of this world. I have handpicked you. I have chosen you. Out of everybody that could have been chosen, I chose you. Out of everybody I could have picked, I picked you. Out of everybody I could have married, I married you. Out of everybody I could have purchased, I purchased you. Out of everybody I could have bought and paid for, I bought and paid for you. Hallelujah. What an exciting thought. He goes on to say, therefore the world hateth you. Why? Because he has chosen us out of the world. That's why they hate us. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 21 and 22, Apostle Paul again is writing, Now he which establisheth us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God, who hath also sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. I've talked before about the concept of earnest. And we know from real estate transactions what earnest means, what earnest money is. When you put down earnest money, that is money that you will not get back if you decide to back out of that deal. And that's the reason why when someone is ready to enter into a deal and they put down a, a, a good sum, a healthy sum of money, they are very much motivated to follow through on the purchase because they have a lot in earnest. They have a lot of money tied up in that transaction. But you see, the wonderful thing about Jesus is God has given us the Holy Ghost as the earnest, as the down payment on our redemption. But the interesting thing is, in our primary text today, Paul lets us know that we already are God's purchased possession. So therefore, God in earnest has given us everything. He's paid everything. He's held nothing back. He said, I'll tell you what, I'm not just going to give you a deposit today and come back later and pay you the rest. He said, no, I'll pay the bill in full and I'll come back later and pick up what's mine. Hallelujah. When you're selling cars, it's amazing. Every once in a while, you'll get people walk in and they look like they crawled out under a rock somewhere. And you're thinking, oh, Lord, do I have to wait on these people? <sighs> and then you get to waiting on them, you know, and you're dealing well. I'll never forget one couple. They look, both of them look like they've been beached on a beach somewhere. Just a mess. Dressed like a couple of bums. I mean, just horrible. And they wanted to do the dumbest thing I ever heard in my life. They wanted to trade in a brand new, beautiful Ford minivan with all the luxury package for a stripped down model, didn't have nothing. And I remember thinking, these people are out of their tree. 
they hadn't had the new van for more than a couple of months. And I said, are you aware of the term upside down? Do you know what that means? I said, you folks are so upside down, you're standing up again. You've done a 360. You know, you're, you're, a, you're at the circus just flipping around on a trapeze. That's how upside down you are. I said, you folks will owe thousands more than this vehicle is worth and then you're going to have to come up with more money on the new vehicle to put down in order to drive it off the lot. And the man looks at his wife, and she looks at him and says, well, what do you think? And she says, whatever you want. And, you know, you're the one who said you want to strip down the van, you know. Yeah, the kids are always playing with the power windows and this and that, and we're afraid they're going to bust everything up. and." We just don't want all that power stuff, you know. That we've got four kids, and they're just tearing everything up. I don't want to ruin a perfectly good van, and be better for us to have it. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Well, how much exactly do we need to put down? So I go to my manager. He gives me the figure. I come back, and I'm just no. Once I tell these people how much, I just know they're going to jump up, scream, and run out of the, you know. So I come back. I said, Well, you'd need six thousand to get out of that van. Then you're going to need another two thousand to get into this van. So $8,000. So husband turns to wife, oh, all right, well, that's not so bad. Write the check. I'm sitting there dumbfounded. And you all know that doesn't happen often. I'm sitting there dumbfounded, and I'm thinking, write the check. I thought you all were going to jump up and scream and leave, you know. And they're t he's saying, write the check. But, you know, when you got it, you can do that sort of thing. When you got that kind of money, well, all of a sudden, I begin to take the credit application on these people. I found out that this man worked for the government way up in high-level something so-and-so, and this lady was a head librarian of the entire city of Austin, Texas, and uh, this lady made bukus of money, and this guy made bukus of money. Put the two of them together, they made buku bukus of money. They had money coming out their wazoo, you know, they had money every which way but upside down. That 8000 didn't mean nothing to them. It didn't mean diddly squat to them. So they were able to pay it. But you know what? It's one thing to be able to get yourself out of an upside down. It's one thing to be able to get yourself into a new vehicle. It's another thing. God had everything that was necessary so that he could come and he could pay the price and we could be become his cherished possession, his purchased possession, and he would be able to pay all that was necessary. You see, the devil can't even look up toward heaven and say, God, don't forget, you still owe. You still owe on this one. Don't you forget, God, you still owe on that person. No, no, no. Devil, I've been bought and paid for. I'm God's purchased possession. I'm just waiting for the rapture. I'm just waiting for the redemption of the church. I got news for you, devil. There is nothing owed on this soul. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Bought and paid for. Free and clear. The Word of God tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 4 and 5, for we that are in this tabernacle, meaning in this human body, do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought, wrought us for the self same thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. You see, once again, Paul refers to that earnest to that down payment, to that large substantial, which in this case, God's substantial down payment was the full price. You know, when Jesus hung on the cross of Calvary, if you go back to the Greek and you read the words that are translated in the King James as the Lord hung there just before he gave up the ghost and he said, It is finished! If you go back to the Greek and you read it, you'll find that he literally said, Oh, hallelujah. He said, paid in full. <laughs> That's what he said. He said, paid in full. Paid in full. God, that feels good. I'll tell you. Paid in full. He said, there ain't nothing left, baby. 
it is all done. That's why the veil in the temple was rent in twain, and there was no longer a division between the people and their God, because it was paid in full. There was nothing left to be paid. God don't owe a dime on you. He's paid it all up front, and you are his most prized possession, just like Rachel as Jacob looked on her and just fell in love and had such a love and such a desire, God chose us the same way. Say, oh, Lord, I wish somebody looked at me with that kind of desire. God says, I have. I have. I looked at you, and I had such a desire for you that I picked you out of thousands and said, that one's going to be mine. That one's going to be mine. I want that one. And, of course, God knows the hearts and minds of men. He didn't choose us based on some arbitrary uh, criteria. No. He said, you know what? That one will love me back. That one there will believe me. That one there will trust my word. That one there will, will take what I say and run with it. That one there will follow through and live the life that I asked her to live or asked him to live. And he said, that's the one I want right there. Amen. You know, anybody picks a wife or a mate or a partner or a husband or a donkey or a mule or a car, you're going to try to pick the best one you can. And you're going to try to pick the best one you can afford. Thank God. God could afford anything he needed to afford. There wasn't a price high enough. I could just see the devil trying to trade with him and say, well, now, I don't know. I, I, I think a million, God, would be good for Donna. And the Lord say, okay, a million. And he said, well, now, wait a minute. You know, you kind of went for that million awful fast. Maybe I should go for a million five. All right, a million five. Well, I don't know. Uh, you know, a million five. I'm really beginning to look at her and realize that, you know, she, she'd really do good for me, you know. And, uh, and, well, how much do you want, devil? Well, how about two million? All right, then, two million. Whatever you want, I I've got it, hallelujah. Whatever you want, I provided for it at Calvary. Whatever you want, it is paid in full, hallelujah. Doesn't matter how high the price. The devil says, I'd rather reign in hell than serve in heaven. Of course, that's not scripture. That's Dante's writing. But you know, he's going, he's going to rule in hell all right for a while. But after a while, he's going to find out he's no longer the king of hell, but rather he's just another one of the prisoners. Amen. He's going to find out he just, he's not he's no longer the warden. Now he's just one of the prisoners. Amen. The word of the Lord tells us, and I'm finishing right now, this is how God views us. This is how the Lord sees us tonight. Paid in full. He sees us as bought and paid for. And a voice, Revelation 19, 5 through 9, and a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. <laughs> and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, Right! Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Oh, I tell you, church, when we finally get where we're going, we're going to be something to look at. God didn't pay a big price for junk. I'll close with this story tonight. I've told this before over the years, but it's a wonderful uh illustration. There was a man many years ago in some eastern, Middle Eastern country. I forget which country. It was a country where when you found the woman you'd like to marry, you had to present a dowry to the parents of that woman. And this one man was just the laughing stock in town. Everybody thought he just the funniest thing going. 
And this one gentleman was sent to write an article on this man. He was very, very wealthy, very, very prominent businessman in this small city. And as he was going to this man's home, every time he'd ask, do you know where Mr. So-and-so lives? Everybody started laughing. And he's thinking, well, what in the world's the joke? Where's the joke? Well, he finally finds his way to the man's house, and they're sitting in the home, and uh, the man in here speaking, and, you know, he's trying to set up this article that he's writing about this prominent businessman who's made such a name for himself and so wealthy and so successful. And this beautiful geisha-type woman comes in and serves them tea, you know, and brings them little finger foods and all that, and then she steps out and all. And the man who's writing the article just was struck by the woman and thought, my God, what a gorgeous, beautiful woman he has for a servant. And as they're speaking, he, he finally gets up the nerve and he says to this man, I have to ask you, he said, as I was trying to find your house and I'm asking different people where you live, People were laughing. He said, why would they do that? And the man said, oh, that. <laughs> he said, well, in these parts, he said, you know, most people are fairly poor. And if they find a bride that's beautiful and talented and skillful and has, you know, great uh, abilities and all this and can really be a wonderful wife and she's absolutely gorgeous, he said, then uh, most men around these parts would offer a cow, a single cow, in exchange for that woman's hand in marriage. He said, they laugh at me because I found my wife, and uh, I offered ten cows for my wife. So, but my wife, when I met her, he said she was just a little, plain girl didn't look like nothing, didn't seem like she had very many skills or very many abilities and all that. He said, but uh, I saw something there that they weren't seeing. He said, as far as I'm concerned to this day, I believe I made a good investment. I gave 10 cows that was worth every, every dime that I spent for that woman. And the man said to the, to the rich, wealthy man, he said, well, one day I'd, I'd be curious. I'd love to meet your wife. He said, you have. She's been serving us all afternoon. And that reporter sat there and said, you, you can't be for real. That woman is gorgeous. And she's been coming in here, and according to the customs of the land, she's been so skillful, and everything has been just, you know how they do in certain parts of the world, everything has been just perfect. You know, when she pours the tea, if she's supposed to lift her pinky, she lifts her pinky. She has all the social graces. She has all the social skills. She, you know, he said, how in the world can it be possible? You're telling me that this beautiful, gorgeous, talented, skillful woman started out as just a little plain Jane? The man said, yes, that's what I'm telling you. And that's why they laugh at me. Because I didn't see what she was. I saw what she could be. Jesus paid a high price. But he bought us all. Amen. He paid a high price, but he bought us all. That we might be part of the church. That we might be part of his bride. Not, my friend, because of what we are, but because of what he sees we can be. And he sees what we're going to be. And he knows that when the trumpet blows, that he knows exactly what our hopes are, what our desires are, what our dreams are. And we're going to realize those hopes and those desires and those dreams. The Bible said, where a man's treasures are, there also shall his heart be. And, you know, that's why sometimes people think they can fool God. You can't fool God. But I'll tell you, if, if your heart is really in heavenly places, and if your, your desire is really to one day be in the presence of the King, and to live with Him and serve Him and know Him for, throughout eternity, then, my friend, that's what's going to happen. Amen. That's what's going to happen. Because it's not about what we are. It's about what He sees in us and what we will be. Would you stand with me tonight? Amen. There's a little chorus 
that we used to sing when I was a kid in Sunday school. And I was thinking about it on the way to church tonight, and I said, you know what? This chorus would be so perfect for after this message because I love the message in it. It's such a simple chorus. But it simply says, The way to peace is the power of the cross. His banner over me is love. The way to peace is the power of the cross. His banner over me is love. The way to peace is the power of the cross. His banner over me is love. His banner over me is love. Now listen to this verse. I'm my beloved, and he is mine. His banner over me is love. I'm my beloved, and he is mine. His banner over me is love. I'm my beloved, and he is mine. His banner over me is love. His banner over me is love. Thank God. Isn't it wonderful that his banner over us tonight isn't judgment? It isn't criticism. It isn't hatred. It isn't uh, all of these things that so many preach. His banner over me tonight is love. And I am my beloved, and he is mine. I'm bought and paid for, paid in full, nothing remains. Master, we thank you, God, for this evening. We thank you for this word of encouragement that you placed on my heart. Help us, Lord, to understand deep in our soul just how important we are to you. We know how important you are to us. But, Lord, we need to understand how important we are to you. God, if more people tonight really understood how important they are to your scheme of things, if more people understood tonight just how important they were to your plan and that which you were trying to do, there'd be more people in this church than there are tonight. There'd be more people than we'd be able to hold in this little building. Because, God, there are people tonight that just don't realize how important they are to your plan and to your purpose in this life. They don't realize that they are a precious, very important possession that you have purchased with a very high price, but no price was too high. Master, in the name of Jesus, help us to celebrate our value to you. Help us to celebrate the fact, God, that we are so valuable to you. Help us to celebrate the fact, Lord, that you look upon us with such desire that you've handpicked us and chosen us to be amongst those that will leave this uh, earth at the moment of the redemption, at the moment of the rapture. Master, in Jesus' name we pray, God, help this word just to find its way into the deepest part of our heart and spirit. Lord, that we might be encouraged and blessed, for we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. God bless you, and amen.